Hello everyone, this is Dr. Paul Rose again, and this is the second in my series of presentations on doing a research project and what does it look like. We've now moved down my egg timer diagram, and we're going to look at something more specific that follows the introduction, your aims, objectives, and hypotheses, how these allow you to turn the review of the literature in your introduction into the testable questions that you will then use to explain the methods that you use for data collection. It's very important that you understand the differences between aims, objectives, hypotheses and research questions. We need to think about what they show to the reader and whether or not they are needed for every type of research project. For qualitative studies, descriptive studies that might be survey based, that have explanation or opinion or the output of questionnaires, we don't always have quantifiable alternative and null hypotheses. But for quantitative research projects with numeric data, we should be writing quantifiable, supported or refuted null and experimental hypotheses. So we're going to look at the differences between aims and objectives, what a research question is, and how to write hypotheses that are very specific to the point, the reason why you are conducting your data collection. First up, we're going to look at aims. We write this first, and it comes at the end of our introduction. Once you have reviewed the literature and you've explained what is out there, and where there's a gap in knowledge, you should tell the reader the aim of your study. The aim is a statement of what you intend to do. It's supported by your evaluation of the literature so that the reader can see why you have presented those examples and explained what is out there and also what's missing from the available literature. So let's imagine that our research project was looking at the behaviour of mallard ducks that are being fed by humans down the local park. We've reviewed the literature and we found that supplementary feeding of wildlife can change its behaviour. We have noticed that people are interested in aggressive interactions between birds and there might be a relationship between the amount of supplementary food they get and the level of aggressive behaviour. So the aim of this type of project could be the aim of this research is to understand the influence of supplementary feeding on aggressive behaviour in mallard ducks in an urban park. It doesn't tell the reader how we're going to do this. It simply tells the reader, this is the point of my research. I want to know whether or not feeding the ducks makes them angry. That is the aim of my research. Have a go at writing an aim for your title and research area that you are interested in. Next up, we come to the objectives of our study. And the objective is often confused with the aim, but it's quite different. The objective explains how you intend to meet your aim. What will you do that shows the reader how you have fulfilled the aim of your research? It provides the reader with a description of what methods will be employed because the methods are how you are going to work out whether or not you've actually met your aim. So let's go back to my duck project. The aim is to see whether or not feeding the ducks increases aggressive behaviour. So how will we do that? So our objective will be to look at the birds and to record the instances of aggression that we see. So the objective of this project could be mallard behaviour will be observed during medium, low and high periods of public feeding. And we will compare the frequency of aggressive interactions with these different categories of supplementary feeding. We've explained what we're going to do. We've explained how we will do it and we've explained what population we will use. So we have turned our aim into an objective by explaining where we will collect our data 
on what we will collect our data and how we will go about collecting our data. So the objective comes after the aim has been written. To have valid aims and objectives, it's really important to understand your research question. And the research question is the broad sweep of your research project. It's normally introduced to the reader in the first paragraph of your introduction, where you are explaining the wider concept of what you're investigating. It's best to filter in the research question early in the introduction so the reader can see the scope of the literature that you are explaining. The research question is not a hypothesis, and I'm explaining this now because the hypotheses come after the aims and objectives. Hypotheses are testable questions that are supported or refuted. The main difference between the research question and the hypotheses is that the research question is not predictive, it's simply inquisitive. It's the general information around the research area that you're interested in. For example, the research question for my Mallard study could be, this study wished to understand why the aggressive behaviour of ducks may change with different degrees of public feeding. We can factor that into our review of the literature by explaining to the reader why we have chosen the sources and examples that we have to evaluate in our introduction. The hypotheses are written after the aims and objectives. They come before the methods because a valid set of hypotheses allows the reader to see why the data collection methods have been chosen. Write a statement if you have a qualitative piece of research or a pair of null and alternative or experimental hypotheses if you are doing a quantitative project. Please remember we support or refute our hypotheses. We do not prove or disprove in science because one day somebody might falsify a potentially proven piece of work. So always say support or refute. Be valid and ethical in how you write up your science. Always consider what your data may look like when you're choosing your methods and writing your hypotheses. Always run a pilot study to make sure your methods work. That's how you will know you will get an appropriate data set to support or refute your hypotheses. Never change your hypotheses once you have collected your data and never change your hypotheses if you get the wrong stats outcome, i.e. if you've got insignificant results. Insignificance is not important. You can still have an excellent research project without any significance. It depends on how you evaluate it. It's incredibly unethical and goes against the scientific method to change hypotheses once you have used them as the basis for your methods. As I just said, hypotheses can differ between quantitative and qualitative studies. Qualitative studies can have a descriptive hypothesis that explains the potential trend or proposed finding. This is simply a statement that is written before the methods. So if I wasn't looking at the duck's behaviour, I was looking at the opinion of what people thought about feeding the ducks. My hypothesis could be people that spend more time feeding the ducks are going to be more attuned to their behaviour rather than people that spend less time feeding the ducks. It's descriptive and explanatory, but it cannot be tested in the same way as a quantitative hypothesis. Quantitative study will have a null hypothesis, an H0, which means there is no difference between my independent and dependent variables, and an experimental hypothesis, which shows that there is a difference between my independent and dependent variables. And hypotheses are going to be written as a pair that shows the reader where that difference may lie. For example, in my duck study, my null hypothesis will be there's no impact of public feeding on the aggressive behaviour of mallard ducks. My independent variable, 
is the public feeding and my dependent variable is the bird's response, the level of aggression. My experimental hypothesis, I have shown where that difference may lie. So my experimental hypothesis could be with higher rates, with higher levels of public feeding, the rate of aggressive interaction will also increase. There'll be more aggression between ducks. So as my independent variable increases, as there's more public feeding, so my dependent variable will increase alongside of it. More aggression because there's more food for the birds to gather together around. That's for a quantitative study where I've collected numeric data on the animal's responses to the thing that they are responding to. So for a checklist for your aims, objectives and hypotheses. Is your aim a simple explanation of your intentions? Does it tell the reader what you intend to study or investigate? Are your objectives an explanation of how you will meet your aim? Do the objectives broad brush, basically tell the reader the methods or approaches that you will use to meet your aim? Is your research question reflected in the supporting information and links back to your aim? Include the research question in the wider introduction to guide your review of the literature. Remember that the hypotheses are different from the research question. The research question is inquisitive, the hypotheses are predictive. Are the hypotheses testable and repeatable? And are they relevant to your study, qualitative or quantitative? And have you identified a difference and where that difference may lie if you are running a quantitative study? Think about how you've reviewed the literature, think about what other people have researched and therefore decide whether or not your difference from your independent and dependent variable will go in a particular direction. Just like I showed you with my fictitious example with the supplementary feeding and the duck's behaviour. Now that we've got our introduction, we've set the scene and explained the supporting literature, now that we've written our aims, objectives and hypotheses, the next thing we need to do is write a valid and repeatable method. And that will be the subject of my next presentation. Thank you very much.